In this video, we are going to cover the cost of living in Seattle. I'm Christian Harris, the founder of the Seatown Real Estate Team. I live, work, and play right here in Seattle and have for years. I'm not going to bore you with some lengthy intro or insult your intelligence by telling you how to subscribe to YouTube. You've been watching YouTube for a while. You know how to use this thing. Uh, if you do have any questions on how to get a hold of me or any additional resources that I mentioned in this video, you can look in the description down below. I'll have all the links and information down there for you. So let's get into this. Uh, the cost of living in Seattle. So obviously the biggest non-negotiable when it comes to moving to a new place uh, and the first top priority is finding where you want to live, what neighborhood. The cost of housing, whether that's going to be an apartment or a house that you buy, is going to be your biggest chunk, uh, your biggest expense for the month. Let's, you know, let's do a little orientation, I guess, of uh, kind of the Seattle area and where it is in context um, to the rest of the state just so uh, when when you move there, you know, if you move there, you'll understand kind of what people are talking about when talking about you know, west side or east side or uh, metro area or whatever. So, uh, so here we are looking at a map of Washington State. Um, you will notice the, that there is a mountain range, a uh, fairly substantial mountain range called the Cascades that runs from Canada uh, down through Oregon and into California, I believe. But we'll just, we're just going to focus on Washington. Mount Rainier is right smack dab in the middle of that mountain range. Um, and this mountain range splits Washington between what people call Western Washington and Eastern Washington. Uh, as far as the climate goes and stuff, you know, Western Washington, when people think of Washington, they usually think of oceans and pine trees and rivers and lakes and that kind of stuff. And so that's all going to be like Western Washington. Uh, a lot of rain, very green, uh, very temperate uh, climate. It doesn't get very cold, doesn't get very hot. When you get to the east side of the mountains, it's much more like the Midwest where in the winter time uh, it gets a lot colder there's a lot of snow it's fairly flat you know maybe some rolling hills and stuff a lot of farmland a lot of vineyards that sort of stuff um, in the summertime it gets uh, really hot and you also have uh, this these mountains over here which are the Olympic Peninsula which has Olympic mountain rains it's a it's a rainforest um, so well, it's pretty popular like go backpacking over here there's a lot of you know wildlife from you know, bears and uh, elk herds and, and goats and, and that sort of stuff um, and it's only a couple hour drive from Seattle so it's really beautiful. Um, Seattle here, we'll zoom in, is right on the Puget Sound is what they call this and so the actual ocean is still you know a couple hundred miles away via uh, the the Strait of Juan de Fuca here. So really really you have Seattle proper is uh, kind of wedged here between two bodies of water. You've got the Puget Sound here which is uh, obviously salt water coming from the ocean and then you have Lake Washington uh, which is a, uh, a man-made lake. Uh, it is quite substantial. So when you're in Seattle and people are talking east side west side usually they mean east side uh, of the lake or west side of the lake which is going to be Seattle. Um, so east side you know there's a lot of money over here. Bellevue is you know kind of known for being luxury and, and posh and kind of luxury brands and, and shopping and that kind of stuff. And so you've got you know Seattle here. We'll take a look at some of the housing because that's you know usually where you start when you're talking cost of living. And so you've got 95 neighborhoods in Seattle and you know Seattle tends to be very proud of their neighborhoods you know um, whether that's you know kind of North Seattle like we're talking Ballard and, and Wallingford and that area or the actual downtown corridor um, or you have West Seattle over here which is a little sleepier um, but also very uh, very nice area and there's Alki Beach here which is really you know probably the, the most popular uh, beach area uh, even though the water doesn't get that warm in the summertime it does have nice uh, sandy beaches um, then you have you know kind of the South Seattle uh, area over here so we're talking like at the time of this recording we've got uh, 1500 homes you know roughly for sale in seattle and they range from about three hundred thousand dollars which is going to be a, a small condo to 9.5 million which is obviously going to be a large you know luxury property more than likely with a view you know there's a wide range of houses you know there's houseboats on uh you know lake union here um, so that you could you buy a houseboat here, which typically is going to have a view of like the Space Needle and downtown and you have, you know, float planes flying in. Um, it's pretty, pretty unique way to live to obviously condos, uh, which are going to be pretty affordable or townhouses, which is kind of that, that gap between condos and single family homes. And then obviously a lot of uh, single family houses as well. Um, so just kind of give you a, a snapshot of the market. So in October of 2021, the median list price of homes in Seattle was uh, $750,000, which is 3.5% uh, higher year over year 
um, and the median sale price was 785. So that shows a upward trajectory of how much properties are, are listed for and how much they actually sell for. So overall, you know, it is still the seller's market, even though, you know, this time of year, um, which is, you know, getting to the holidays, um, it slows down typically, but we're still seeing an upward trajectory, even though it's slowed a little bit. Uh, average days on market, we're looking at 36 days. Um, cream of the crop houses are in, that are super desirable in you know nice neighborhoods that people want to live in are still selling in you know two days five days uh, but on average uh, taking everything into account 36 days on market is where things are at so you've got kind of the most expensive area to live at least right now is alki point which is kind of this this strip here along the water um, obviously you know get an amazing view you know western view and so you know when you're looking to the west uh, from from here you've got the cascade mountain range and so you've got the sunset you know behind the mountains uh, over the ocean it's just gorgeous that uh it's the most expensive area right now average list price of 1.1 million while lower queen anne uh, which is this area. It's the, the side of Queen Anne that faces downtown. Uh, it's the most affordable at just under $500,000. Um, and that's primarily because there's a bunch of you know, older, small condos uh, in this area that have great walkability to downtown shops and stuff. Um, but you know, those condos are definitely gonna be the more affordable option around Seattle. You know, West Seattle is kind of you know the area that I tend to focus in, and so as far as that goes, it's a higher median list price of eight hundred thousand, and then slightly higher uh, sale price of eight oh eight. Burien, um, and I mentioned Burien just because it's the closest city, you know, just to the south of, of Seattle. So Burien, right in in this area, uh, which nestles up against the SeaTac Airport, that city consists of eighteen neighborhoods. Uh, currently, seventy homes on the market. Uh, ranging from 215,000 to 2.7 million. So it's a little more affordable price range um, as well. So, you know, a lot of times when people were, are getting, you know, priced out of Seattle, they end up uh, moving into suburbs and beer in which you still have easy access, you know, via 509, 518 um, to get to, you know, I-5 to get into downtown uh, if you're working in the city. So the next most important aspect of the cost of living is gonna be your income potential and taxes. Obviously that's a huge effect on whether or not you um, can afford and have a good quality of living in an area. So Washington State's good thing um, about here is that we don't have any income tax. Uh, the downside is we do have a, a sales tax, um, and that's a sales tax of 10.1%. Pull up the uh, living wage calculator here, which is pretty handy to look at. So let's take a look at the living wage in Seattle. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with what that, that concept is, it's the minimum amount of money that you need uh, to live above the poverty threshold. In Seattle, that amount is $18.56 per hour for a full-time employee. Uh, you look at that right here. Uh, if you have a child, you know that goes up to $35 per person. Now you want to keep in mind the living wage does not include expenses for restaurants, entertainment, or vacations. Uh, additionally, it doesn't allow for savings or investing either. It's just the amount of money you need to survive on, uh, with necessities. Um, the estimated median household income in Seattle at the end of 2019 was approximately $92,000. So keep in mind that Seattle's affluence uh, is growing alongside its population growth. The number of Seattle families earning over $200,000 a year is actually greater than the number making less than $50,000 a year. Um, but don't let these numbers intimidate you from moving to Seattle. Uh, it may, however, mean that you'll need to broaden your, your search to where you're living um, to you know, not just include your, your dream neighborhoods, but maybe look outside of that into the suburbs a little bit um, or into up and coming neighborhoods around Seattle. So some additional costs here, uh, transportation is, is a big question for a lot of people because uh, if you're not working from home, then obviously you're gonna have to consider how long it's gonna take you, what the cost is to get to your job. While traffic you know, is notoriously bad in Seattle, um, that's primarily you know, because it, it bottlenecks you know, going through Seattle here in I-5. So um, if you work on one side of the city or the other, you know, my recommendation is that you try to buy a house um, on that side of the city. You know, so if you are you know working down here in kind of South Seattle, you typically are not going to want to have a house up in North Seattle because you know trying to get through downtown Seattle is uh, is, is a nightmare. I really like the West Seattle area, Burien uh, over here because it's actually fairly easy to get into. You got these additional freeways going in, so you have 509, which drops into what they call Soto here, so South Downtown, and it also you know bumps over to I-5. As far as you know the cost of transportation, you really don't need a car you know to to live in. Seattle, really obviously depending on your job and, and how much flexibility you need. 
So really next to housing, transportation could be one of your more expensive costs. So when it comes to transportation, the numbers say, you know, as a single adult living in the Emerald City, that you can expect to spend around $5,000 in transportation annually. Uh, if you're a family of two, both full-time employed uh, adults and a child, you'll pay a, about $11,000 a year to get around town. Uh, but look, let's look at public transportation. So you look back at this map here, um, there's, you know, as long as you're on a bus line, which there's quite a few of them, uh, it's pretty easy to get in and out of downtown Seattle or even over to the east side, which is, you know, where T-Mobile is and Microsoft and, um, you know, Google and, and whatnot. So um, it's fairly easy to get around. You don't need a car to, to live in the city, especially if you're downtown, you can either walk or take the bus. So there are actually two public transportation agencies in the city of Seattle. There's King County Metro Transit and Sound Transit. Uh, King County Metro is the bus system, while Sound Transit is the link or the light rail, uh, which ranges from $2.25 to $3.25. But if you do plan on driving and owning a car, let's look at the gas prices in Seattle. Um, it's actually some of the highest in the country at 18% higher than the national average. Um, and that's actually true of pretty much uh, you know, west of the Rock Rockies is really, it's, it's some of the most expensive gas in the country. Um, so the national average is $3.31 a gallon, while Seattle average is just over $4 a gallon. As far as insurance goes, uh, you're going to look at spending around, you know, $248 per month on average, uh, which is or just about $3,000 a, a year. So these average rates actually make Washington state the 18th most expensive state in the country for car insurance rates and 10% more expensive than the national average. So next, let's talk groceries. So in Seattle, according to the MIT estimates, a single family full-time employed adult that cooks their own meals, including snacks, spends approximately $3,792 per year on food. So that's you know $316 a month. Um, our family of three, so this is just you know us, we spend about $600 a month or $7,200 a year on groceries, uh, but that doesn't include eating out uh, or restaurants, which is a lot more than I'd like to admit. So based on the Nielsen survey in the Seattle metro area, the median amount spent by households on groceries per week totals about $152 from February to August of 2020, which comes out about $608 a month, which is about what we're spending. Uh, this represents an increase of 25% or $30 a week uh, for the same period of 2019 when the median amount was about $120. So, so what does that mean? It means the price of groceries is going up. There's obviously a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of the, the big ones is uh, probably just, you know, since the pandemic started, uh, a lot more people are buying groceries and cooking at home rather than going out to eat at restaurants. Seattle is a bit of a, a foodie city, and so there's tons of food options uh, when it comes to groceries and restaurants and whatnot. So, you know, everything from the, the affordable, you know, grocery outlet and discounts, grocery stores, to year-round farmer's markets and discount produce stands, to upscale grocery stores like Whole Foods, and then specialty markets and ethnic markets and whatnot. Overall, Seattleites are more health conscious, so organic, free-range, hormone-free, free, non-GMO, allergy sensitive foods abound. You can find them, you know, everywhere. And that typically is gonna make the food more expensive as well. So that could also contribute to why uh, the cost of groceries is uh, higher here than elsewhere. One of the good news is in Washington state, there's no tax on most grocery items. Washington law exempts most grocery type foods from retail sales tax. Uh, however, this law does not exempt prepared foods. So anything prepackaged or a soft drink uh, or dietary supplements, uh, none of that's included. Included. Also, unfortunately, alcoholic beverages is not included in that. Let's move on to utilities. And so from here, you know, we're talking for things like uh, electricity, natural gas, water, um, you know, Wi-Fi, cable, that, that sort of stuff. So here in Seattle and uh, Washington in general, there's a pretty big diversity of where electricity comes from. Uh, there's obviously with so many rivers, there's a lot of hydroelectric, which makes the power very affordable. Um, it's one of the you know the fewer you know non-subsidized uh, affordable renewable energy sources and there's a lot of it here so it makes electricity uh, fairly cheap compared to the rest of the country for an apartment you're looking at approximately 80 dollars per month uh, for natural gas you know electricity in uh, the seattle area is provided by the city-owned seattle city lights while natural gas you use for you know heating is actually supplied by a privately owned puget, puget sound energy 
So this means that natural gas prices are prone to slightly more fluctuation than electrical cost, uh, especially in the harsher winter months. However, they're still relatively reasonable for most of the year. Uh, during December and January, the average gas bill for Seattle apartments is roughly $100. Uh, on the other hand, the summer months will result in a much uh, lower natural gas bill, uh, averaging around $60 a month. Uh, a big reason for this is uh, something I mentioned earlier, which is that Seattle and Western Washington in general has very mild climate, you know, because we're uh, so close to the to, to the ocean, uh, it really doesn't get that cold. Rarely drops below freezing. It really doesn't get that hot. You know, maybe maybe 85 degrees on the on a summer day, um, and because of that, not many people have AC, which means in the summertime you've got much lower electrical costs. Um, I suppose to the rest of the country that's running, you know. AC 24 seven because it gets so gosh darn hot. So when it comes to water, obviously Seattle has tons of water, fresh water, rivers, it makes water relatively cheap and very abundant. So when you're talking about water and sewer bills, those utilities come billed uh, monthly and, and usually together because the exact sewer usage can't be accurately tracked. The sewer rate will often be based on your, your water usage, um, which it averages around $65 a month apartment around here. Unless you have a sudden spike in water usage, your sewer charges usually don't have much variation from month to month. Uh, while your sewer bill stays relatively consistent, Seattle charges a peak rate for water usage uh, during the summer months to discourage overuse. This means that your water bill will be slightly higher from May to September, even if your usage remains the same. When it comes to you know Wi-Fi and cable, um, the, your most affordable option you know typically for internet is paired with you know your favorite streaming service or with cable. Uh, two largest providers, you know high-speed internet providers, in Seattle are CenturyLink and Comcast Xfinity. Both offer fiber in most areas, you know which is up to one gig, you know, speeds. So the average price of those plans is around $35 per month. Uh, if you do bundle it with cable, you'll be paying more around $50 to $70 a month. So for childcare, uh, it looks like the averages are, you know, $1,500 to $2,000 a month for one child. Um, or if you, you know, look at this chart here, about $10,000 per year. I'm not exactly sure where they're pulling those numbers from. Uh, obviously that's gonna depend on uh, the type of childcare. The next category is schools. So Seattle hosts 133 public schools that are rated as good or higher by greater schools. Uh, so I believe that's a, a five or higher in their 10, uh, the 10 point grading system. Um, and you can also find 95 private and charter schools as well. A little breakdown for you, at just over $1 billion per year, school district officials now have just shy of $20,000 per students to spend on 52,931 students in 101 schools. So that's more money than most private schools receive in tuition. Um, if you send your kids to private school, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll know that you know, $20,000 a year for a student is on the high end for a private school um, as far as you know, K through 12. Uh, the top three school districts within Washington State for college readiness are Mercer Island, which is this bad boy right here, right in the middle of Lake Washington. Um, very affluent community. There's I-90, you know, floating bridge that connects uh, Seattle and Mercer Island, and Mercer Island and Bellevue. And then uh, obviously you have Bellevue, uh, which is you know very affluent, as I was saying. You know, a lot of a lot of tech, a lot of jobs. And then Lake Washington, which is actually in the the Kirkland area. A couple others, you know, to to mention that are noteworthy um, are also Shoreline, which is right up in this area. It's just north of Seattle, um, as well as Issaquah, which is out I-90 here, out this direction, right there. So after going over all those expenses, there are is some good news. There are a lot of free fun things to do around here. So kind of in summary, you know, while the cost of living here in Seattle is fairly high compared to the rest of the country, there's a reason that so many people are moving here, why so many people stay here, why uh, they rave about it. I mean, really, you know, when you get here and you look around, just the, the majesty of the amazing uh, beauty around you is really breathtaking. You know, the job market here is, you know, consistently good, especially in the tech industries. Uh, your weather is fairly mild, um, you know, it doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold. There is a fair amount of rain, um, but it's not a lot of rain. It's just, you know, kind of number of, of cloudy, drizzly days uh, can be on the higher side. Uh, actual quantity isn't that bad. Most areas of the country get more rain in quantity, you know, in inches than we do. Um, but it is absolutely gorgeous, you know, with outdoor lovers paradise, with mountains and lakes, rivers and oceans, um, you know, all, and all those things are within an hour drive of, of Seattle. So to, you know, take a, an evening or a weekend trip uh, up into the mountains or backpacking uh, is super easy. So really, I mean, Seattle is, is quite amazing. 
housing. Quality of life here is really high, which is why so many people want to live here and move here and are willing to, to spend a little extra to live out this direction. So I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, obviously, if you have any questions uh, or you want to get a hold of me or any additional resources, those links are all down below in the description section. Appreciate you joining me and I'll see you next time.